we're going to look at Romans chapter 12 here this morning, Romans chapter 12, and we're going to begin just by reading the first, um, the first 16 verses, all right? So Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another." Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Father, I pray as we study your word here this morning, uh, we do uh, want to remember uh, prayer requests mentioned for Tyler, who uh, who is going to have a rough go of it here with the end of the semester there. We pray for him. We pray that you would focus our minds on on your word also, uh, that... that uh, you would help us to understand it and taking it a step further than that in understanding it to apply it to our lives. And uh, we know that that is possible and, and true by your Holy Spirit. So we ask that you do that. Help me as I preach uh, to be faithful to the text of Scripture and to the will of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to focus you on this one verse this this morning, Romans 12 in verse 10. And it's kind of an interesting passage of scripture that we've just gone through. It's just rapid fire, one after another, this, this, this command, boom, 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 boom. So I, I kind of have to take it one at a time. Otherwise, it would be a, almost a scatterbrained message if I was to go through all of these in one sermon. So um, Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, though, provides us plenty to talk about this morning. Be kindly affectionate to one, uh, to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another. I'm sure that you're familiar with the popular Christian saying that goes something like this. I love him, but I don't have to like him, right? Or I, I have to love him, but that doesn't mean I have to like him, right? Or her, you could substitute him or her, right? Um, and, and, and I'm sure that most of us can think of a fellow Christian who makes that statement personally attractive, right? Into that sentiment, the Holy Spirit speaks and says, no, no. And he says it in strong terms. And so God commands us to express brotherly love. And he's basically saying, you have to love him and, and you have to like him. How do we do that? And, and I want to address that in a moment, but let's consider this question. First of all, can God command what you feel? Or how can he command what you feel? It, is it legitimate for God to say, you must not only love your brothers and sisters in Christ with actions and words, but you must love them in your minds and in your attitudes and in your feelings? When God says, love one another, can we help what we feel? And does he legitimately command our feelings? I believe that God does legitimately command our feelings, and I believe we're accountable for it. If he commands it, we're accountable. 
he, he does so with more than just love. Here in Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. What's he doing? He's commanding us to feel joy. That's a feeling. God commands us to feel sympathy. We read this earlier. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. God commands us to feel grateful. And verse Colossians 3, 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. Notice this is a command of our being and not of our doing. It does not say give thanks. That, that is in other passages of scripture, but here it says be thankful. God commands us even to be mournful and to weep over our sins. James 4, 9 says, Lament and war- mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. And these are just four examples of the many myriads of commands that God gives us in Scripture where he commands our feelings. Now, I, uh, we, we live in the age of the rom-com, right? You know what I'm talking about? The romantic comedy where where it, reality or the reality of the genre is pitched in a way that two people fall in love. Uh, their, their eyes meet and whatever. Then you have to contrive some kind of a weird thing to make them mad at each other halfway through so the movie can be longer, right? Otherwise, it would just be over. Um, and, and the idea is these two people have no control over how they feel. Well... It is true that feelings can come on you strongly, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and I don't deny that, but God does give us accountability for how we feel. And so he commands us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our hearts are truly distorted by sin, so we often do not feel as we should feel. That's the sinful condition that we live in. But that does not mean that God cannot command what is good and right for us to feel. And we are responsible for our feelings. We're accountable for that. So the command is not for us to love certain Christians with actions even while we secretly cannot stand them. No, because that would, if we back up to verse 9, it says, let love be without what? hypocrisy. That would be love with hypocrisy. I hate that person, but I'm going to pretend to love them. Uh, So you're responsible to, to make sure that you deal with the things in your heart that block the flow of love that you feel for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Warren Wiersbe said, love is a circulatory system of the spiritual body. It is the blood flowing through the, the body of Christ. And, and uh, you know, sometimes there, there uh, seems to be a blood clot in the system. Things that block the flow of love and affection within the blood, body of Christ and within our own hearts. And the church at Rome, for instance, had experienced such blockages in the day in which Paul wrote this letter. One main, main blockage was a cultural difference between Jews and Gentiles within that very church. And this, culture, this, this cultural difference expressed itself in a difference of convictions about certain holidays and certain dietary choices. And it resulted in some believers despising and judging one another. Different scruples about diet um, blocked their brotherly affection. Look at Romans 14 verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. And so, because of some differing scruples about food, some people in that church judged others, and others despised some. There were differing scruples about holy days. Romans 14, verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So over observances of certain holidays or certain holy days, uh, there was a blockage in the system, the circulatory system of love in that body of Christ. Christians today do have some serious 
disagreements about diet and holidays. Uh, I, I see uh, people who, you know, often I see people who think that uh, the Christmas trees are pagan and they're out to, on Facebook to prove that you should never put one up. Others get bent out of shape if you have Easter eggs. Uh, some Christians go trick-or-treating while others stay uh, away from that. Um, and those differences of opinion should not divide the body of Christ. And, and, and the scripture says, be fully persuaded in your own mind. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I, I have strong opinions on some of those things. But in most cases, someone is right, or at least more right about their opinion, and someone is wrong, or at least more wrong about that opinion. Uh, but, but the kids collecting candy and Batman costumes are probably not really worshiping the devil on October 31st. <laughs> You know, and, and, and the parents who keep their kids home from that are probably not really cursing your name and looking down on you. And, and, the, and the parents refusing to go trick-or-treating probably don't think they're better than you. And the kids who are going trick-or-treating are probably not selling their souls for candy. And if one despises the other and the other judges the one, then everybody's wrong. And your scruples divide the body of Christ. And then you have blood clots in the circulatory system of the church. The body of Christ in Rome was in danger of heart attack. What was the basis of this type of a problem? Well, uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers in that church had many differences. And, and uh, those differences were causing friction. Uh, we get that, right? I mean, um, we deem it impossible to like a person until something in that person changes. Like, I will, I will love them because I'm supposed to love them, but I can't like them because they're this way, and that just rubs me the wrong way. Well, guess what? Just go ahead and be rubbed the wrong way, all right? Guess what? You'll survive. It'll be okay. And we say, um, I have to love him, but I don't have to like him. But... Is that real love? Leo Tolstoy speaks to this. He says, uh, I don't know if he was a Christian or not, but this is uh, insightful. When you love someone, you love that person as they are and not as you'd like them to be. What a boring world this would be if everybody was the way you wanted them to be, right? There'd be no variety. Um, some people really do need to change, but aren't you glad that God didn't wait for you to change before he loved you? The church at Rome had a blockage against this love. What remedy would Paul prescribe for that, for that blockage? Well, he, the remedy he gives them, he commands them to honest brotherly love. We need the same medicine, so how can we take it? We can, how can we cultivate and express brotherly love? First of all, we express brotherly love through familial affection. Familial affection. This is the affection of a family being devoted to one another. And we express brotherly love for other believers this way. Family affection, devotion, and our text demands it. Look at that. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Be kindly affectionate. Um, so the text is commanding this brotherly love of us. And it tells us two ways to express it. One is to be kindly affectionate. Um, and that's the first way. We'll just focus on that. What does it mean to be kindly affectionate? Well, this refers to tender affection. It particularly refers to a family type of affection. And so this verse commands Christians to have a tender affection for one another with the love that a family has. Now, if you grew up in a dysfunctional family, you might struggle to understand this analogy. And my heart goes out to you for that. I, did, I, I was blessed to grow up in a family that, that loved one another. Sometimes, many times, people do not get that privilege and so if that's you, try to, try to put that out of your mind and understand that the Bible here, the Holy Spirit here is using the ideal family as a, and that would be better than any family that we ever lived in. Uh, but the ideal family here is devoted to one another. Uh, and, and, and so try to consider that one love that loves and is devoted to one another. The early church um, identified and reacted and acted as a, an extended family. Look how Timothy instructs, or Paul instructs Timothy 
He says, do not rebuke an older man. He's talking about in the church, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. See how he describes that relationship here, Paul instructs Timothy to think of members of the church as if they were members of his family. And this isn't all gooey, mushy stuff. Paul is telling Timothy how to enter into a confrontation with other believers in the church. See that? Don't rebuke an older man. In other words, when you confront him about his sin, or if you come to him about something that needs to change, don't come with both, both barrels blazing. <laughs> show him respect as you would show to your father if you had to go to your father with something that needed to change. And so how Timothy conceived of his relationship to them was key. Unfortunately, many modern churches are really run like some kind of a box store corporation. Um, and, and that was not the case from the beginning. That was not the first century version of the church. It was an extended family, most of the time meeting in houses instead of uh, corporately owned buildings. And, and, and truly many members of, the, of that church came from broken families. Many of them were cast out of their natural families when they came to Christ. And so they found a family in the church. And if you come from a broken home situation, you come out of a situation where it was less than ideal, then you should find in the church a better family the family of Christ. So they found family in the church. Paul himself, when he came to Christ, lost everything. And I think he lost uh, family contacts too. Look at how Paul describes in Romans 16, 13, he's just giving his greetings at the end of the letter. He says, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Rufus is not his natural brother. All right. Paul had someone in that church in Rome. Now, he hadn't been to the church in Rome, so he knew this lady from somewhere else, but maybe she had moved to Rome, her and Rufus. And Rufus is his brother and his mother, who he doesn't name, but he looks at her as his own mother. Perhaps Paul, perhaps his mother was not living, uh, or perhaps when he came to faith in Christ, his family cast him out like so many other Christians were cast out. So Paul himself finds this great apostle, a mother in the church at Rome. So the church fellowship is an extended family relationship. Again, the, the command to be kindly affectionate to one another is not a command that is restricted to our actions. We are commanded to feel attached as an ideal family is attached. Look what Peter says, 1 Peter 1, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another, how? fervently with a pure heart that is not just on the outside we express brotherly love through familial action it is real it is genuine it is without hypocrisy and if it is all that it cannot say i love her but i do not like her it can't do that now our text tells us two ways to express brotherly love. And by the way, I've said that many times. <laughs> I love him, but I don't have to like him. I, I'm guilty of that. I, I was going through this text this week and, and, and just like, come on, Paul, get out of my kitchen. This is killing me. <laughs> so I'm not just beating you down with this if you've said it. Man, I've probably said it from this pulpit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and if I did, I stand corrected. So we express brotherly love this way. Familial affection. Secondly, here's the, uh, here's the second way. Express brotherly love by preferential treatment. Treating your brother or sister in Christ with preference. Specifically, giving them preference over yourself and over your own wants and over your own needs and over your own desires. This is how we express brotherly love. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Consider the meaning of giving preference to one another in honor. What does that mean? Giving preference to one another is first a selfless attitude. It begins in the mind. It absolutely concerns itself with how you think and how you conceive yourself and how you conceive other people. That is uh, why this brotherly love is an outworking of Romans chapter 12 in verse 2, where the command is given to us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And before we can uh, think correctly about others, you must first be transformed in how you think about yourself. 
Just look at the two statements here in our text that frame the picture of brotherly love, all right? And it has to do with how we think about ourselves. Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, do not, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. So first of all, he says, don't think too highly of yourself. And we have to have that warning from scripture because that is our natural bent. And then in verse 16, he says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. He's quoting from the Proverbs in there, quoting out of the Old, Old Testament. So you cannot love with brotherly love if you think too highly of, of yourself. You cannot love with brotherly love if in your own mind, you're the one who's always right. In other words, uh, Christian love always says to itself, this is how I understand the issue, but it's possible for me to be wrong. If you're never wrong, if, you're, if you don't consider the possibility that you might be wrong, uh, you're not loving with brotherly love. That doesn't mean that you automatically assume you're wrong. Don't do that. I, th I, think that would, I, I think that would violate where Paul said, let each one be fully persuaded in their own mind. So maybe you can't see how you're wrong, but humility demands. They might say, well, I could be wrong. If, if humility doesn't demand it, experience should. I remember being wrong one time. I think it was 1987. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, no. If you want to know, just ask my wife. She's got, uh, she's got better information. Um, but... At its most fundamental level, thinking better of others than ourselves is being like Jesus. Philippians 2, verses 2 through 5, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not... For, uh, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, I doubt that Jesus walked this earth and thought that other people were uh, morally better than him, <laughs> all right? Because he would have to lie to himself to think that. But he thought of others first, and he, 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 when he esteemed others, he esteemed them with an attitude that put them first. Esteem others better than yourself. It's a selfless attitude. So that's what, that's what giving preference is. It's a selfless attitude. Secondly, it is a selfless action. It must be the attitude first, but then if that attitude exists, it comes out in action. It says, in honor, giving preference to one another. In honor, in honor. What does honor mean? have to do with this what does it mean to give preference to one another in honor I think it means that we would rather give honor than receive honor we prefer to bestow honor on our brothers and sisters in Christ more than we than we prefer to receive it from them you would rather honor them than demand that they honor you um, perhaps I can explain this idea of honoring others with um by showing you what it looks like, just a little mental picture. What does it look like? Well, it looks like dad and grandpa, all right? Hon honoring others looks like dad and grandpa. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, consider three generations at a high school basketball game. One generation is on the court. Two generations are sitting in the bleachers. The generation on the court is at the free throw line. The game is tied. There is one second left in the game. As the generation on the court bounces the ball, its dull thud echoes in the ears of the hushed crowd. Uh, palpable uh, tension heightens with every second of deliberation. That generation then releases the shot with perfect form. The ball hangs in impeccable arc and the sound of its swoosh through the net sends the crowd from silence into thunderous ecstasy. A thousand people shouting the honor of the kid who just made that shot now pan the camera over and look at dad and grandpa in the bleachers. Are they jealous of, his, of that kid's praise? Do they have to force themselves to shout the honor that they seek because they secretly want it for themselves? No. They prefer for that honor to be heaped on the third generation. 
They are not thinking about their, uh, their own honor. Whatever honor that, that they might get is all wrapped up in the kid that just hit that free throw. They are too interested in his honor. And that's what it means to give preference to another in honor. Your actions arise from a selfless attitude and those actions do whatever it takes to make sure that your brother or sister in Christ is honored. It's not, by the way, it's not flattery. Flattery uh, is, is just self-motivated praise. You flatter someone because the purpose of giving them praise is so that you will receive something for it. That's, that's what flattery is. It's a transaction. This is not transactional. You do not look for something in return. Preferring to honor others seeks nothing in return. It simply is overjoyed that that person is exalted in honor. We honor someone by treating them as though they have value showing them that they are worth something, that they're valuable to us. We show them that they are worthy of our service when we honor them. And that's the, hopefully, the meaning. I hope you understand the meaning of honoring others. Uh, but how do we do it? What is the mode? What is the mode of honoring one another? In other words, in what practical ways can we express this preferential treatment to one another? Warren Wearsby says, uh, it's, he calls it treating others as more important than ourselves. That's pretty, pretty simple. I will give you one specific and one general example in scripture. All right. Specifically, honoring others is bearing one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I want this sermon not to be two hours, so I won't go through the, uh, again, many verses that deal with specific ways to do that, uh, specifically way, ways to honor people. But generally, uh, specifically, here's one instance, bearing one another's burdens. It honors them. It shows them that they're worthy of your service. Generally, it's given this way. Therefore, uh, Galatians 6.10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are the household of faith. Again, there's that family, right? The household of faith. And so generally doing good things for other believers. This can include uh, meeting physical or financial needs where you find out about them. It could uh, just be that a person needs someone to listen to them. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen that exercised in our church. Some people just need a, a listening ear. And, and, and it's not always easy to do, but sometimes uh, they, they have a burden that just doesn't need to be borne alone. Listen and pray and listen and sympathize and listen and encourage. We give preference in honor through compassion, through forgiveness, through encouragement, through doing ministry together and with others and for others. Kind words, acts of services, notes of encouragement. There are all ways, all kinds of actions, but all of it comes out of this attitude. But how much? Where do we draw the line? What is the limit of this? So I want you to consider uh, now the measure of giving preference in honor. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us this measure and it's a measure that's very easy to comprehend, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, notice that little word, as. That's a big little word, all right? That means in the same way or with the same amount. I'm not sure which, but maybe both. And we must love our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves or just as much as we love ourselves. However much we would like to be honored and, and highly thought of, we ought to give honor and highly think of others. John Piper gets right in my kitchen with this. Loving our neighbor as ourselves means that we make our self-seeking the measure of our self-giving. We're good at self-seeking. That's natural. I can tell you what self-seeking is. At five o'clock in the morning, my cat meows. And I want to kick that cat. This is just, this is just love for a cat, all right? I don't really want to kick him too hard. But, uh, but I, I don't completely, because it's a cat, so I don't have to show the love of Christ to a cat every day. I go to the coffee maker first. Like he's like, meow, pay attention to me. I'm like, hold on, cat. We're going to the coffee first, <laughs> all right? That's not how you love your neighbor as yourself, right? 
Uh, I would want, if I was appealing to someone at five in the morning, it would be very important and I would want them to really respond right away. But we make our self-seeking the measure of our self-giving. I just want coffee in the morning. That is my self-seeking. It is my comfort. It is my true love. It is, it is uh, the blueness of the sky, the crispness of the air. It is, it is the flora, the fauna. It is all in the morning, at five in the morning. And, uh, uh, and I know how deeply I want to seek that. Can I apply that level of devotion to somebody else? to a neighbor, to a brother and sister in Christ. Let me ask you this. With this measure, we take our self-seeking, make that the measure of our self-giving. How much would you like to be forgiven of your faults, husbands and wives? Well, get in your kitchen, right? I, I learned a new phrase this year, this week, by the way. I think I learned it yesterday. Did I learn that yesterday? Did you hear that, Mike? Was that something that he said? No? Okay, I must have read it. Um, all right. How much would you like your words to be understood and not picked apart and not have extra meaning read into them or assumptions? How much would you like to be encouraged? How many kind words would you like to receive? How much grace would you like to be shown if you need to be confronted and corrected? Jesus takes this a step further. Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. All the Old Testament's wrapped up in this. Giving preference to one another means that we make our self-seeking the measure of our self-giving because we naturally love ourselves and we don't have to work at that. We are born with self-interest. So uh, this is the perfect measure. What about the model? Does anybody model this for us? Why, yes, Jesus does. John chapter 13, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he had girded. <clears throat> we know the story, right? Uh, and so Jesus took the job of a lowly servant and Peter was so shocked by this self-abasement that Peter initially refused to allow Jesus to do it. He did not want to see Jesus so degraded. Jesus left that place of honor at the head of the table and he lowered himself and honored others. Jesus then said, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15, for I, for I have given you an example. Here's another big little word. That you should do as I have done to you. Jesus said the point of the example is not for us to talk about it or to stare at it in wonder or to form beautiful sermons about it. The point is an example for us to copy it. We do not practice foot washing as a church ordinance. We believe Jesus meant uh, for us to take the example of humble service and apply that in many practical ways. But I wonder, is there any person in this room today whose feet you'd absolutely refuse to wash? <laughs> All right, is there? I, maybe not. If there is, you have a problem. You have a problem because you can't obey this. You say, well, it'd be disgusting. That's the point. That's the point. You mothers know what I'm talking about, right? Before the kids, can, actually, maybe, maybe this is more applicable to dads, right? Because I, I can see this through my own eyes a little better. Before the babies came along, I didn't do bodily fluids at all. Don't care. No. That never changed a diaper. Babies came along, middle of the night, fluids going everywhere. And I'm just like, roll up my sleeves and dive in. Not even that grossed out about it. Now that stage is over. Can't do it anymore. All right? I can't do that for somebody else's kids. I just, you know, some of you ladies, you're able to do that. Bless you. But uh, anyway, <laughs> the, the point is, it's so disgusting, but the love makes it not. I mean, it, it, it still understands that the, the senses work. But the love says, I'm going to just going to, I'm going to look past that and serve, even with joy. 
Why? And by the way, remember whose feet Jesus washed. You say, I can't wash so-and-so's feet. They didn't shake my hand last week. <laughs> or they said this, and it hurt me. Anybody ever been hurt in church? Mm-hmm. Me too. They said this, and it hurt me. I couldn't wash their feet. Jesus washed the feet of Judas Iscariot on the night, the night that Judas would kiss him to get him crucified. And he knew it was going to happen. Christ is our model. Do what he did. Emulate the model. Are there blockages that hinder the flow of brotherly or sisterly love in your heart today? What causes these things? In, the re- in reality, the majority of blockages coming out of our hearts and minds, that's where they come from, the hearts and the minds. Let us not become conceited, Galatians 5.26, provoking one another, envying one another. Conceited, what's that mean? Thinking too highly of yourself. Self-seeking is the major thinking problem that blocks brotherly love. James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. Look at the opposite, look at the, the flip side of that about love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up with pride, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, not easily offended. That's what that means. Thinks no evil. Yeah, it gets hurt because it's, it's a real human being. It does feel pain, but it does not take that pain and make it an offense where it holds a grudge. Self-seeking should be easy to spot in our lives because it causes us to be so easily offended. If you're always offended, then you're selfish. Sorry. People may do things that deservedly offend you, but if all you do is carry around those grudges, you're stuck on yourself and you need to repent. You really do. Because you imagine that you're the only one that suffers as you do. And there's 8 billion people in the world that suffer as you do. It's, see, see, this brotherly love, its major concern is the glory and the respect and the honor of God. And self-seeking, its major concern is the glory <clears throat> and the respect and the honor that others must show to it rather than God's glory and honor for others. Self-seekers are never wrong in their own eyes. Self-seekers are often provoking discord and finding their, their fighting for their own interests and desires to be more important in their eyes than the unity of the body of Christ. As a remedy for this, God prescribes for us brotherly love. Take the pill, if you, if, even if it's hard to swallow. And so... Express brotherly love through familial affection. Don't say, as I have said, I know I've said it, I love them, but I don't have to like them. That's wrong. For when I've said it, I repent. Familial affection and preferential treatment. This morning, let's take three actions, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer here. Action number one is diagnostic. Identify blockages in your heart that hinders brotherly love. Look at yourself and think about maybe the person that you have to love but you can't like. And ask yourself, why is it that I can't like them? Now, here's the thing with family Some people crack their knuckles in the family and it drives other people nuts. Don't ask my wife about that, all right? But here's the thing with family. Families are far from perfect, right? But you don't kick your kids out of the family because even for grievous sins that they've done, right? You just, you don't necessarily approve of everything, but you don't hate them. Um, 
So what is it about that person that you can't like? Is it because you're just very different people? Some of us in here are very different people. And we wouldn't hang out on a Sunday morning if we didn't have Jesus between us, right? I mean, some of us are older than others. Some of us are younger than others. Some of us have different interests. Um, you know, some of you guys are really, really manly. Like you're going to go this, this year, you're going to shoot something big, gut it out, hang it somewhere and smoke the meat, right? Some of you guys are just, some of you guys are so, some of you guys are going to take pieces of wood and build beautiful things. And I envy you. I, I failed shop class. <laughs> All right. And while you're doing that, I'm reading British literature. That's why we don't hang out much. All right? Because you're a normal guy and I'm weird. I can't even grow a beard. And uh, there might be some, something about me. It's like, I, I have to like him. He's the pastor and I'm outvoted. I can't vote him out. Right? Uh, and, and I may look at you and think, you know, this and this and this stands between us. And I have to like them, but I can't. I, I, I can't. I have to love them, but I can't like them. No. What, what's, what's causing the blockage? Whatever it is, you can say, well, it's their fault. No. No. They might be contributing factors, but it's your fault. Only you are responsible for your heart. Repent. Here's the second step. Identify first step. Identify blockages in your heart. Second step. Repent and ask Christ for victory to remove those blockages. You can't do it on your own. You need grace upon grace upon grace. It's he that brings us together. Thirdly, visualize practical ways to express brotherly love. And, and maybe decide to take action on one of those this week. Say, I'm going to put this into practical action this week. You might have to do that with your wife or your husband. I don't know how you walked in this morning. If you were like trying to kill each other in the car and then you walked in with smiles on your face. No one's ever done that, right? When I grew up, we lived across the parking lot from the church, so we, we had to try to kill each other in the foyer of the house and then smile all the way across. You may have to do, take, identify something and take a practical step with repentance with your husband or your wife or your kids or your parents. But I ask you to decide and take one action this week. Let's stand together.